Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. Yes, I'm back during an international break. I know this is a time that maybe you just want to kind of hide away from Tottenham Hotspur. I, there's a temptation myself to do it as well, especially if they've been evil enough to go into five consecutive international breaks on the back of a defeat. Um, yes, there are definitely days when I'd rather be thinking about anything else than Tottenham Hotspur, but unfortunately, I kind of have no choice. <laughs> Apart from the fact they're in my blood, seemingly, they are also my work, um, and I cannot escape them. Uh, but I did say, as always, in an international break, if there's enough to talk about, and also people have put enough questions in the comments, like they always do, to have a chat about various things. And yeah, it's just, for some reason, never quite around Tottenham Hotspur anyway. And that's been the case, of course, this week. Actually, today there's been a fair few bits and pieces. Not least, the incredible, and I mean incredible, rebrand of the Tottenham Hotspur badge. I'm kidding. I'm absolutely kidding. Um, they've essentially taken the Tottenham Hotspur off the bottom of the logo. <sighs> Some might argue that the word Tottenham Hotspur anyway has kind of been hidden in recent years anyway. They seem to have done a good old job of that with the various managerial decisions they've made. And uh, that was the point, wasn't it? To get our Tottenham Hotspur back. Yeah, so Tottenham Hotspur, the words have gone. Uh, read into that what you will. Um, the press release claims that it's in order to um, be able to fit the cockerel silhouette into things more easily, into spaces they want to put it in, because you don't have to fit the word to Tottenham Hotspur, and you can do it in any size you want, the cockerel. <laughs> it's just, they're just like, right, whatever. It's almost like these things. I know if you're going to be really boring and bland and corporate speak, every kind of brand and stuff has to have a rebrand every few years. But it's just like, now, just right now, because you've not waited till a time when everyone's like buzzing and happy. It's like, now we'll drop it halfway through international break where everyone's just that little bit peeved at everything. Um, and also bring out a, a logo that is very, very, very much not really changed at all other than removing some words. Um, yeah. hey. It's not one of those things that I, I, I'm going to like wail about. And, oh my God, what have you done? Um, because this is energy is required for so many other things, but it's just a bit like, right, okay, you, you crack on, you keep yourselves busy. Um, but yeah, look, they've got this other stuff as well. They've remastered the font, um, it's kind of this italicized look, which, yeah, if I cared enough, <laughs> I'd probably be like, eh, I don't know if I particularly like it. I mean, it's just one of those things. You look at the website, and the website all looks a bit weird, but it's just because it's probably new. Um, and apparently, the cockerel is now supported by a silhouette version that allows for a more playful expression of the brand. Yes, we like to be playful with the brand, Tottenham Hotspur. Um, it's just such jargony rubbish, isn't it? It just... Uh, if there's ever a way for me to switch off of anything, if I'm in some kind of meeting I've got to be in, is when people start using kind of corporate jargon speakers, uh, especially around football. Um, they've developed this suite of hallmarks to celebrate key heritage features, including Seven Sisters Trees, Bruce Castle, 1882, the club's founding year, of course, to support our brand storytelling. Uh, <laughs> look, the, the little badges are quite cool. I, I like the fact of nodding to the history, so I'm not going to moan about that. Um, I actually quite like the monogram of THFC. They've, they've kind of brought it back again in this kind of remastered way. That looks all right. Um, I've got some quotes for you. Again, offered with no comment. Well, a little bit of comment. But make of them what you will. So Ange Postacoglu has quotes in the press release I was sent. We want to be a certain type of football club. We want success like everyone else, but we want to arrive there doing it our way. The brand represents consistently challenging what you do and looking for an edge. When you do get it right, you create something special. It encapsulates values that are ingrained in what this football club is. We want our people to dream and we want to stand out from the rest and do things a little bit differently. Spurs certainly do things a little bit differently. I cannot argue with that. I mean, in essence, that's kind of what Postacoglu has always said. I'm not entirely sure he would use the words the brand, but there you go. Maybe he did. Uh, next quote for you. Donna Maria Cullen, Executive Director of Tottenham Hotspur, said, This is a club that drives, that forges, that innovates, that is relentless both on and off the pitch, 
This phenomenal exercise has been brought about bringing it all together, defining it, taking it to the next level. The reimagined brand embraces all the excitement, all the innovation, and shows that we're going to be brave, we're going to be exciting, and we're going to have some fun. This is where we should be with our brand right now. We've taken aspects from our history, our emblems, our imagery, and we've taken them forward. We've now got something that we have built from listening to everyone at the club, on and off the pitch, and the consistent message coming through. This is something that everyone can unite behind. It's one of those quotes, isn't it? Where just any average football fan is just going to be like, I don't care. <laughs> just don't care. Just don't care. It's a lot of excitement in a quote that probably brings so little excitement from anyone that's going to listen to it or read it. Um, again, what I said, what you take from it, you can take from the fact that it wasn't Daniel Levy, instead one of his directors, um, perhaps to not be saying words like that right now. Um, and secondly, I, I do kind of find it quite amusing that relentless is the word that's been used in that quote. Relentless is the postacogly buzzword, isn't it? That that's his football is relentless. He he wants his teams to be relentless. That is a word he constantly used. So interesting that they're kind of pitching this whole kind of thing with using a buzzword of postacoglus. Um I don't think we can say Spurs have been particularly relentless over the years. I don't think um you know they've been brave either, particularly. I, I'm constantly saying it, so this is nothing new, but to dare to, to dare is to do is the motto, and I don't think Spurs often dare, and they rarely do. So uh, I'm sure you know. I'm sorry, uh, or, or forgive me, even if if all of that kind of falls a little flat with what we've seen over recent years. Um, but yeah, look. <laughs> like I say, crack on. If, that, that is, if that's the important things right now in the company is rebranding, then then yeah, crack on. Um, it's uh, I just I thought I'd put it first because it was the uh, probably the latest thing that happened today in terms of little bits and pieces, and uh, some people might like it. You know, people in the graphic design world might find it very interesting. Um, but yes, that's probably the last time. Hopefully, I'll ever speak about um, a. Brand rebrand or whatever it's called. Can you have a brand rebrand? I guess you can. A brand remastering, whatever it's called. Uh, let's talk about actual football things um, and not things about PR speak. Um, we had the worst kept disciplinary uh, secret confirmed today, which was Rodrigo Bentancourt has indeed been handed a seven-game suspension, a £100,000 fine, uh, for the comments that he made in a, an interview back in Uruguay, which came out in June and obviously regarded uh, his captain, Sonny, Son Heung Min. Um, and yeah, the, the, aside from the fact that what we knew was going to come to pass has come to pass uh, and people have their various opinions on it, I made mine very clear at the time and they haven't changed. Um, daft thing to say, stupid thing to say at the time. And it is still a stupid thing to say even now, but that's my opinion. I dived into the, there's a quite a lot of documents around this case um, that were released today by the FA because the uh, Independent Regulatory Commission that decided all of that, um, they had all of this, these bits and pieces really. And there's actually, there's a fair bit of interesting detail within them. Um, so I kind of, I dived into them so you don't have to. Um, yeah, and it's got not only little details around the actual interview that I found quite interesting, but also you kind of got to hear Benson Coors, um how do I put this, explanation for what he said and what he believed was the tone of it, um, which, again, you could decide, you know, what you believe in, in all of this, uh, but it was certainly one aspect that um, maybe... Uh, wasn't uh, put forward at the time, especially by himself as well. So again, that's all going to come into this. So if you're not aware, Bentico was charged for a breach of FA rule E3 in relation to this media interview. Just going to give you the very, just for this bit, this is the only technical bit, just so you know exactly what the charge was. It was alleged that the midfielder breached FA rule E3.1 as he acted in an improper manner uh, and or used abusive and or insulting words and or, there's lots of and ors, brought not the brilliant Star Wars TV show and or uh, brought the game into disrepute 
It was further alleged that this constitutes an aggravated breach, which is defined in FA Rule E3.2, as it included a reference, whether expressed or implied, to nationality and or race and or ethnic origin. Um, yeah, so Bentico denied the charge, um, but the Independent Regulatory Commission found it to be proven, um, and it imposed these sanctions that we now have. Um, so Spurs have still got a set amount of time to decide whether they're going to appeal the decision or not. Uh, there have been no indication thus far as, as to what that, whether they will appeal or not. The suspension itself <coughs> begins immediately. Uh, he'll miss six Premier League games and the Carabao Cup quarter final against Manchester United. I think he returns. He'll be able to return on Boxing Day. I think is the game. Is that Forest away? I'm trying to remember now. I think it is. Um, he will because it's a domestic ban. He will be able to play in the Europa League matches against Roma and Rangers that are popping up during this period as well. So, yeah, from a, a Spurs perspective, a Postecoglou's perspective, he will have him available for a couple of matches still. Um, yeah, so the full set of documents are all in there. Um, he essentially asked for, I think it was not a hearing kind of in person, but a one where the commission would, would look at all the written evidence as well that was put forward by himself and, uh, and the club as well. Um, so their details show, the documents show, that he was interviewed at home by the Uruguayan journalist Rafa Cotello, uh, who was accompanied by an assistant and a cameraman. This is where there's a little bit where I don't think they've entirely checked what they've written here. But documents state that in about June 2024, the player was interviewed at his home, but then it also states that Catello and his team were at Bentacor's house for three to four hours and also saw the player the day before when he was there. Uh, the play they were the player's guest for the Spurs match against Nottingham Forest, which was at home. That would suggest the interview actually took place in April, um, which is what I understand happened. I think it did take place in April, but was published in June. So, yeah, even their documents was a little bit like... I don't know why I made that weird noise. Um, so, yeah, so the key part of the interview, I've said this before, sorry just to repeat it, but it is part of the document. It's kind of part of explaining what comes next in the, in the things that come out of this. So um, there was a request by Catella to see one of the football shirts Bentico had at his home, and here's a translation of the exchange uh, that was used in documents. Catello says, your shirt? Well, what about the Korean shirt? Bentico is Sonny. Uh, says Sonny, Cotello says, or a champion, Bentico says with a laugh, or one of Sonny's cousins, as they all look more or less the same. That is what these documents say that Bentico said. Uh, Bentico said that, which the commission accepted, that Cotello's second comment actually interrupted him and his two comments should be read together. So it should say, Sonny or one of Sonny's cousins, as they all, all more look, sorry, Sonny or one of Sonny's cousins, as they all look more or less the same. Have your own thoughts on whether that's actually any better or not. I don't think it is at all. Um, I think, again, we'll explain why his 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 reasoning behind, why I think, why he wanted that clarified. So, by the time the interview was posted, you might remember, uh, Benzica was on international duty with Uruguay uh, at the Copper America. I think it was just before the Copper America was about to start. Uh, he was informed by Spurs media team, the documents say, that the, the interview had gone online, and he wrote this social media post that you might remember, which he later explained to the commission was from the heart and wasn't without it was without any consultation with the club. Um, you might remember it said Sony. It wasn't Sony. It was like Sony brother. I apologise for you for what happened. Um, it was just a very bad joke. You know what I love you and I would never disrespect you or hurt you or anyone else. I love you, brother. Uh, on Min Son. Bentecor said that he uh, apologised to Sonny personally and then he wrote a longer Instagram post, more, another apology. Sonny responded with an apology just saying you know, he knows he made a mistake, he's spoken to him and he would never intentionally say anything offensive and they're past it and they're united and all of that. So, back to the commission, the actual the, everything that happened uh, in this commission, which was last week, I think it was held, which is why Bentecor and his agent would have known about the actual verdict before it came out. Um, he got a formal charge letter back in September the 11th um, he responded by denying it and yeah November the 12th was when the commission met so we're going to get through this don't worry I'm not going to spend ages on this but I do think there's some quite important stuff within here that we kind of need to to understand and, and hear the, the reasons behind 
the punishment and also behind what he felt uh, he was trying to get across. So, um, so the, everyone was agreement that what was said was not in dispute. Those those things like that that translation I read out a little while ago, nobody disputed though with the actual words and the, the right translation and all of that. Um, and the FA's submission in their side of it, because don't forget. The point of this uh, commission is they hear from the FA with the case against and they hear from Benzica with the case um, against, technically against as well, against the charge. Um, so the FA said there can be no doubt that these words are objectively insulting and or abusive. While, of course, context is Im important that this part and this part of the conversation began with Mr. Catella referring to the Korean, an unfortunate and inappropriate way to refer to human son to respond the way the player did in the words he used and laughter is clearly to be universally regarded as highly offensive and insulting and or abusive and this was a strange paragraph i thought it said although the media had not reported mr catella's earlier use of the word the term the korean it is submitted that in his apologies the suggestion that the player was apologizing not for what he said which is portrayed by the player as a sarcastic and gentle rebuke of Catello for his use of the term Korean, rather than any offensive words he himself had used, but for the inadequate reporting on the interview, which excluded Mr Catello's reference to the Korean, does not survive examination in light of other available evidence. But even if it were an attempt at confronting Mr Catello's inappropriate term of sarcasm and gentle rebuke, what the player said was in any event objectively insulting and or abusive, and thus in breach. So yeah, I found that odd, this kind of angle about the media not using the term the Korean. I looked back at all of my stuff and everything had that in it. Maybe there was other elements in the media that, that left that out. I don't know. But certainly in my stuff, it was it was very clear that that was, was part of the video and that was said. So I, I don't get that. So the FA, just to make this clear, expressly made it clear that it made no assertion that the player is a racist, only that he used words... So only that the words he used in the circumstances he used them when objectively considered amount to an aggravated breach under rules E3.1 and E3.2. So yeah, Benzikos, you got it kind of from the previous bit, Benzikos' defence that he was actually claiming that he was chiding, telling off the reporter in a sarcastic manner for the way that he had referred to Sonny. Um, yeah, and yeah, I mean... It came the words used by the player were in response to Catello's regrettable reference to his colleague and friend Son as the Korean. And it said that the player was surprised and uncomfortable by Catello's use of the term. This is all in the documents. Um, and in so Benzico's observations, which were sent on behalf of him by the club, but it was his observations, explained Rodrigo's reply was sarcastic and a gentle rebuke for the journalist calling Sonny the Korean. Rodrigo does not believe that all Koreans look more or less the same. The context of the exchange clearly shows Rodrigo as being sarcastic. It was Mr. Catello who described Sonny as the Korean. In that context of the conversation, it was obvious that Mr. Catello uh, was referring to Sonny as the Korean and Rodrigo was challenging the journalist in his description of his club teammate. Um, yeah. And it goes on, the words Benzko used were intended to be light-hearted and jocular manner of chiding the journalist for the use of a generalisation that was wholly inappropriate. So they claim the journalist knew Son's name because he used it in another part of the interview conducted at a different time. Um, yeah, so make of that what you will. Um, certainly didn't seem to go down well with the commission, that explanation. Uh, it wasn't kind of accepted. Uh, and he also went into this other bit, Benton Kerr, about the conversation being in the privacy of his home. And he had a reasonable expectation of privacy and moreover, a reasonable expectation that the journalist would show more common sense in what he posted. Um, that he had no editorial control of what was posted for the interview and he expressed surprise, indeed horror, that Catello chose to publish those remarks at all. Um, yeah, again. <laughs> I'm not... Uh, yeah, I'm not, I, I just don't get that. I don't get that at all. And I, again, I don't think they did either, the commission. Um, yeah, so there's a long, there's a long kind of uh, verdict, essentially conclusion from the commission. Just to kind of paraphrase, um, it essentially says that even if he was meaning to be a sarcastic and gentle rebuke, um, it would still be objectively regarded as insulting or highly offensive, um, and it should be universally regarded as such. Um, and they also, the commission says that they feel like the 
apologies that Benzenko then made, the two different ones, and Sonny's uh, post saying, referring to him, saying he knows he made a mistake and things like that, also maybe go against the idea of it being sarcastic and telling off the reporter. It was, if you see what I mean, if you see what I mean, it kind of, that didn't quite uh, tally up, I suppose, with, with that version of, of how it played out. Um, that's, again, this is what they're saying in, in their verdict. Um, and then, yeah, they're, they're very much not keen on the, about the whole privacy thing at all, um, nor were we impressed by the further submission made on the player's behalf that what he said was said in private. Um, yeah. That, that, that's never a good defence. <laughs> it's like, you know, if you're going to go down the route of what I said should have remained private and all that sort of stuff. Um, never when you're yeah, defending yourself in something like that, I would imagine. So, uh, yeah. So essentially, that's kind of the main chunk. Again, I could read out reams more, but I'm very wary that I'm probably losing people over something that we have spoken before about. Um, but yeah, just explaining kind of what happened with that. And also, if you want to know about the sanction itself... Sanction itself, um, they took into account that Benzico had no previous offences of any kind, uh, and there's no evidence before us, of, before us of him ever having engaged in racist or otherwise discriminatory conduct inside or outside football. So that was very clearly pointed out as well. Um, but it was decided that when it came to the 6-12 to 12 game recommended sanction for such a rule breach, um, in terms of culpability and consequences, this breach falls towards the lower end of the guideline range, but not the lowest point. Cases can easily be envisaged which are less serious than this, but nevertheless subject to the minimum suspension of seven match sorry, six matches, which is why they got to the seven match um, verdict in the end. Um, so yeah, so seven domestic club matches, £100,000 fine, and he also has to do a mandatory face-to-face -face education program provided to him by the FA and to be completed by March the 11th of next year. If he does not complete that, then he'll be suspended again until he does. Um, sorry, I should also say, when I said about the commission said that the whole sarcastic telling off the reporter thing didn't tally up with his two apolog uh, apologies publicly, Sonny's uh, message about him making mistakes, it was also they spoke about... Um, Spurs, Spurs' own statement on it and about the need to educate their players and things like that as well. So all of that, I forgot about their bit as well. So yeah, so that's all of that. It's also worth noting that Benzikor is also on four yellow cards right now. So when he returns, if he gets a fifth, he's going to get another game suspension. Um, he's got to hold on until after the 19th game. After that, they get wiped out. So yes, we could end up with him getting another one. Um, some people have asked about why has Benson Corp been dealt with by the FA, uh, yet the Enzo Fernandez incident has not. Uh, that's actually quite a simple one to answer in terms of the FA. It is because the Fernandez incident fell outside of their jurisdiction because it happened on international duty. He was away with Copa America, sorry, the way with Argentina at the Copa America. Um, so that meant it, instead of the FA, it falls to FIFA. They previously said they were looking into the matter. I think the French Football Federation also said that they were going to um, file a legal complaint over it all as well. Um, I did try and get in touch with FIFA today just to kind of see what the latest on that was, but I hadn't, no, still haven't heard anything back on that. Um, yeah, because I just thought I had to write some articles on it. So you can't kind of write about something without having the latest on it, but there is no latest. Um, so yeah, so that falls into FIFA's hands, but with Bentoncourt, his interview was published in June, but the, uh, the actual interview itself appears to have taken place in April. So that meant uh, it was done on an individual basis, not to do away with being with his country, and it fell within the FA's jurisdiction, and that's why they could bring a charge against him. So that's why. Yeah, technically it's, it's all kind of you know, semantics, rules, whatever you want to call it either. Um, and yeah. Yeah, that's why. So Benzikos said his thing, got his ban, and essentially it sounds like everyone within the club is certainly trying to move on from it. Ben Davies was the first person asked about it today. He had a Wales press conference, and he said, I read the news this morning, probably just like everyone else did. 
it's something that it felt like at Spurs it's been handled in-house and now it's been handled outside as well. I think that as a group, as a team at Tottenham, we've all put a line under it and moved on. But I think ultimately it's important that we realise that these kind of things need to be looked at with the seriousness that it has been. As far as I'm concerned and the team's concerned, there's a line under it now and we move on. Um, yes, yes, we do. That, that, that's, that is one kind of aspect of getting this verdict now and suspension and is that we can now that's it that's why i had to bring it up again we had to discuss it because it's new news again um and you know we have the ban now and we have the reasons behind it and we have benzico's defense and you know you've got to put some of that across and and to kind of get as much balance to it as we possibly can uh to as it not <sighs> balance to it but to hear both sides as you have to do in anything um, and now, yes, so Spurs will be without Rodrigo Bentecourt for seven domestic games in total. Um, the fact that he can play against Roma at least means injuries aside, it shouldn't affect the next week or so of football, barring, yeah, barring like Basuma picking up an injury or something. Uh, but then after that, the following Thursday, of course, there's the trip to Bournemouth. <sighs> That's a tough week then. Will Basuma be able to play three games in a week? And after that Thursday game, they'll have the home game against Chelsea. So that's a big ask. Um, yeah, could Archie Gray come in for some of those? Um, you know, I've just been watching before I came on this, actually. I don't know how it ended up, but Archie Gray was playing for the England under 21s. Um, and God, that kid could, he just plays everywhere. They were playing him on what looked like the right of a back three, the times became a back four. Um, Ealing Jr. Uh, would come back and fill in as a left back when he was a wing back, but yeah, he just just plays everywhere. Archer going, he's playing well from what I was watching, from what I saw. Dane Scarlett also played, scored a lovely goal. He'd opened the scoring after about five minutes, diving header from uh, Ealing Jr.'s um, cross into the box. But uh, yeah, so you could have Archie Gray perhaps in there. All of this defensive kind of position work that he's doing in his other roles, I think will really help him as a number six. And of course, that's the position I, I think that he'll end up being his long-term position. Others say maybe a number eight, but we'll see. Um, but yeah, of course, then we've got the Rangers game up in Glasgow that Benzico will be able to play, but he will not be able to play in the Carabao Cup quarterfinal against Ruben Amrin's Man United side. That is, of course, going to be a bit of an issue because that's a busy week as well. Um, I mean, you could play Saar there, perhaps. Saar has certainly played as a defensive midfielder for Mets in the past, and, and he's quite a tactically disciplined player, so maybe. You could go wild uh, and play Romero there. Um, it's, I don't think he's ever played there from kind of memory, but he's kind of got the technical ability to do it. Um, has he got the discipline to stay there? I don't know. <laughs> That's another thing. Uh, of course, the more immediate issue is his foot. Came off at half-time in Argentina's defeat in Paraguay with that right foot that was a problem for him against Villa. Um, so we'll see whether that's got any worse or not. Um, I think he's I'm sure. I was trying to remember this as I was writing about stuff. Pretty sure earlier in the year he announced that he was going to become a dad again for a second time. That must be kind of getting around to that stage. Um, I can't remember exactly when, but I was just thinking the other day. It must be coming up soon. Um, but yeah, so he's got his foot problem, and we'll see whether having nine days off after playing 45 minutes of football will help in any way. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll find out, because you could probably do with him against Man City. I know he's not on top form right now, but you know you could do with your, with your best players still, and he is a World Cup winner and a very experienced player as well. Um, who else will be fit for City out of the bunch that was injured before? We don't really know about Mickey van der Ven. Postacoglu said while I was away, the last thing he said on him is he will be back after the international break. When it will be, will be dictated by his progress during that time. The end of the international break is probably about four weeks. This is when he said it. It'll be some time after that. When exactly, we'll have to see. So whether it's, you know, whether it's the City game or whether it's going to take a little bit more time, we shall find out. Postacoglu's press conference is 1 o'clock on Friday at Hotspur Way. Uh, Mikey Moore really struggled with the virus he had um, before the international break as well. And, and, you know, we know viruses stick around in your system. I would imagine, especially at his age, they're going to be a little bit kind of careful with him and bringing him back. And such high-intensity football, you don't want to throw him into it when he's... Uh, if it hasn't left his system entirely, 
Um, we know Wilson Odebert, unfortunately, will be out for some time now. He underwent surgery on his right hamstring. Um, the Spurs said the 19-year-old will continue to be closely monitored by our medical team to determine when he can return to training. Odebert himself actually provided a little update the day before on his Instagram account. It was just a photo of essentially his legs in his hospital bed uh, in what he put on there was the Princess Grace Hospital in Marylebone, London. Uh, with the caption, thanks God. So, yeah. I mean, hopefully that means that it was successful. Um, yeah, I was saying, did it actually... Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's happened, hasn't it, now? So, I haven't heard otherwise. Uh, Richardson, we know, is going to be out for a while with a significant hamstring injury. Timo Werner had been carrying a groin problem. Uh, he came back against Ipswich, but you would imagine he was carrying it still at that point. So, again, maybe these two weeks will have helped him shake that off. Um, there was a stat that came up in midweek. I think it was on Sky. Spurs sit on top of the table. At the top of the table. When it comes to players that have missed matches in the Premier League through injuries this season, um, they've had 13 injuries to first-team players where someone has been forced to miss a game or more this season. And that is more than anyone else. Brighton and Ipswich both on 12, Aston Villa and Palace on 11, Arsenal and City have both had 10 such injuries that have caused a player to miss one or more matches. Um, all the way at the bottom, West Ham, just two injuries that have caused someone to miss a game or more. Um, and when it comes to days lost to injuries during the Premier League this season, Spurs came in sixth with a combined total of 273 days so far. There you go. Uh, if you're interested, the team with the most is Brighton with 397. Um, and again, all the way at the bottom, West Ham with 84 days lost to injuries. Um, yeah, God, my Twitter feed is still people taking the mickey out of all the uh, of the rebranding stuff. It's just like, such a strange time to do it. I'm sure it was a date that was set in stone probably a long time ago, but read the room. Spurs, I think I've said this a million times, but Spurs really are one of the worst clubs at reading the room. They just have no idea. The lack of self-awareness is incredible at times at that club. Um, but there you go. Again, as I said, it's not the biggest thing in the world, but it is just going to open you up to kind of a bit of ridicule and especially not really changing the badge and just taking off some words. And then everyone then comparing the change in badge and, and on all the various sites I've seen them all joking about it. See, so, yeah, just another thing to laugh at Spurs about. Hey, great start. Um, the other thing I did this week was have a little look at what Spurs might need in the January transfer window. Um, so I can have a little chat about that. I mean, we spoke about the goalkeeper position, I think, in a recent video. Um, and still have the same thoughts on that. Vicario started for Italy yesterday. Don't think it went particularly well. Um, I don't think I even have to think it didn't go particularly well. Um, it got beaten by France and set piece issues as well. I think there was blame on him for the first goal. Second goal was unfortunate. It actually got kind of tagged as an own goal in the end. And the third goal, I think people were saying there was nothing he could do about it. But yeah, I don't think he came away with it absolutely, but you know, covered in glory, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, and that kind of leads into this really is that we said before, I think Spurs need someone to push him and compete with him over the coming years. Fraser Forster, 36 years old now, his contract's coming to an end this summer. Not entirely sold on the fact that he really fits Postacoglu football. He is a kind of a big popular person behind the scenes, a very, very good professional. Um, but I don't think he's the ideal fit for the, uh, the Postacoglu high line, really. And then, of course, you've got Brandon Austin, who signed a five-year contract at the end of last season. It's, you would have thought to become number two, and that hasn't happened at all. And then you've got Alfie Whiteman, who, like Forster, I think his contract's coming to an end in this summer. So, yeah, you could look at it that do you tie up a goalkeeper in the January window to arrive in the summer, or do you just go in and try and bring someone in in January? You would think it's probably likely to be more tie up a goalkeeper for the summer or just go for a goalkeeper in the summer. Um, the other issue, of course, is that pesky Europa League squad, if they get through to the knockout stages, that um, Austin and Whiteman are both um, their only club trained players, homegrown players. Forster is non um, 
locally trained. So if you're bringing in a new goalkeeper of any kind, whether they're homegrown or not, um, you would have to register them in the main bunch and you would have to presumably take out Forster or someone else. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the goalkeeping department. I'd be surprised if they brought in someone for the now in January just because of... Uh, uh, just I suppose it would depend on, on whether the perfect kind of fit was around right now. I think it would make more sense in the summer at this point or to secure it for the summer. But you never know with Spurs. They sometimes do some random things. Fullbacks, I think this is a key area for January. It is really. I think we all know that. I mean, Destiny Doggy, who, you know, missed most of pre-season, um, had that surgery, that was it, April, I think, on his quadriceps. It's come back in and he has played more games than any other outfield player at the club. 1,207 to his name. Um, and the fact that Ben Davies now isn't really seen as a left back. Postacoglu choosing not to register um, Jed Spence for the Europa League squad. And it's kind of meant that Destiny has played a lot, a lot of football when he wasn't probably ready for that, perhaps. And then I think his performances haven't really hit the heights, maybe because of that. Um, so yeah, on the left, I mean, we've seen Archie Gray having to play there at times as well. I th think surely in the January window, you have to look at an, either a left back or a, a central defender that can play as a left back as well. Um, because yeah, he needs some support there. I mean, presumably you could get away to the end of the season with playing Jed Spence there, but you've got to play him there. <laughs> It kind of felt like we were getting somewhere with Jed. Uh, he was getting some minutes here and there, making an impact, scored against Coventry, got a new contract. And then it was suddenly like, where's Jed? Where's Jed? And I know he got an injury, but even when he came back, he hasn't really got, I don't think he's got any minutes since signing the new contract. I don't think he has at all. Um, so, yeah, I, I kind of feel like a decision has to be made there. Is he going to be the left back or is he not going to be kind of, is he going to be seen as one of the right back? options um i think right back you've probably got enough with 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 poro with spence with archie gray able to play there as well i think you've probably got enough in that position but left back wouldn't be against that again europa league squad that's a whole other issue that we know would have to be sorted um central defense obviously we've got the four options well normally romero van der ven Drangshin, and davies um Four competitions kind of at some point hopefully Spurs will be in if they can stay in um, all the ones they're in right now. That's going to get stretched, just having four defenders. Um, Davies' contract also up in the summer as well. Um, I mean, I go back to a quote. I put it to Postacoglu towards the end of the summer window that he'd swapped Eric Dyer with Radu Dragishin. So he'd kind of just done a like for like. But he'd also said towards the end of last season that he wanted another centre-back. So surely he needed another centre-back. And he said, no, and I don't think we're in the same position. I think Radu is a different proposition for us. And certainly with Archie coming into the group and Jed probably not being in the plans initially. But now in, I think we're in, as, in a, a much different position than we were last year. We've got Ben Davies as well, obviously, who can play at centre-back or at left-back. But again, I mean, that's the discipline of it. Yeah, we can go out and sign another centre-back, but if the right player's not there, I'm not going to do it. It's as simple as that. I'm not, I never have, I never will. For me, it's about getting the right people in, and there wasn't an opportunity for us to bring in someone who I thought was going to add to our group, so we don't do it. We've got Ashley Phillips, we've got young Luka Vuskovic available next year, two young centre-backs. I don't want to block their pathway by doing something now. It might look from the outside like we've got another player, but if that player is not going to be suitable for what we're doing and not going to fit in, why would I bring them in and potentially block the path for someone else? So, yeah, I think we've spoken about that quote before. There's little elements to it. It's like, can I mention Ashley Phillips? But they never really has given Ashley Phillips much of a look in. Vuskovic, certainly a very exciting player. Uh, will he be ready for the Premier League at 18 years old? I know he's big and physical. Certainly some of the talk out of Belgium has been he's an excellent player. But he's very much a raw young player learning his trade. And he's obviously only 17 right now. Uh, but will be 18 by the time he arrives at Spurs. So it's a big ask to kind of throw him into that. But I guess as a, f I was about to say, as a fifth choice centre back. But then Davies may go. This could be the end of the the Ben Davies, you know, decade 
he's been at the club. It'll be 11 years by the time next summer comes around. So, yeah. And obviously, this just feels like, doesn't it, that always Romero and Van de Ven are out roughly the same time, or they have games where they both miss. So, yeah, personally, I would like to see another centre-back come in. As someone that is always keen on young players getting their chance, I do appreciate the fact that that blocks the path. And I know he doesn't like short-termism stuff. But even if it were like a Timo Werner loan deal type thing until the end of the season, I can't, I don't like this idea of always thinking like, oh, well, whatever happens this season happens. Because there's a lot of this season left and they could have injuries and they could have more problems and they go across four competitions, hopefully. And I, I do get that you're looking to the future and you don't want to bring in short-term stuff if they don't. But if someone does fit into your philosophy, the feeling was that Timo Werner fitted into the philosophy and that was a short-term initially loan deal as well with an option. I don't see why you couldn't do that with a central defender. Look, Timo Werner technically you could argue was blocking a part of Mikey Moore. Um, so, eh, I don't know. Does, does that really tally up? I don't know. Uh, midfield. I think number six is at the moment, as in in terms of January, are probably covered. You've got Benson Kerr, Basuma, Archie Gray. Uh, Spurs obviously have secured this option as well on Johnny Cardoso from Real Betis, uh, which is available, I think, for isn't it a two-week period in the summer window. Um, he's actually, I think he's got a hamstring injury at the moment. Even just being, kind of having an option with Spurs gets you a hamstring injury, which seems harsh. Um, but yeah, I think for this season, you've probably got enough there. We'll certainly find out over the next couple of weeks. Um, Pat Matasar, Deki Kulisevsky, James Madison, Lucas Bergval, Bergval, they flesh out the rest of the midfield. So there are quite a few midfield options. Uh, and Bergval and Gray are going to get better and better, I feel, as this season goes on. I'm sure Postacoglu would love to have, if there's another creative midfielder, I'm sure he would love to have it. But... I suppose you do also have to look at the fact that Spurs have created more chances than most other sides this season. Um, and it would have to be someone perfect, I think, for that role. Um, or a versatile player that can play in various roles. Um, otherwise, I would imagine that's more a position that's looked at in the summer. Just because of the, the amount of bodies in the role in the positions now. Attack. <laughs> attack! Um, in attack. Spurs are the top scorers in the league. They have scored 35 in all competitions. But you still kind of feel like that's an area that needs attention. And I kind of feel like Postacoglu's always looking at that those positions as well. Because um, don't forget, if, if you can, um, you know, Odebert and Richardson we know are going to be missing for a while. Kulisewski's now a deeper midfielder. So that does put a lot of pressure, really, on Sonny and Brennan Johnson as wingers and um, Dominic Solanke as the striker as well. So I do feel like that's, that's got to be a position. You look at another person there. Again, even if it is just a short-term kind of loan thing. Um, yes, they've got Timo Werner. We know with Timo Werner, he's carrying this groin injury, lack of confidence at times as well. You've got Mikey Moore, huge talent, but you have to be careful with him, especially with this virus at the moment he's had. Um, I know some of the fan base have been calling for Werner's deal to be cut short in January. That's not quite as easy as it seems if Spurs did want to do that. Often the option lies with the uh, club that have loaned him out. So Leipzig in this case, um, you might remember Galatasaray weren't too keen on keeping Tongi for the rest of that season, but Spurs had the option. Uh, Spurs were the ones who could have brought it back, and Spurs were seemingly, no, you're right, you can have him. You've paid for him, or you're paying something for him, you can have him. Um, and yeah, so. I also kind of feel like you've got Werner there as well. I don't think you let go of him and then bring someone else in. It kind of almost feels a bit like, well, it's, it's the numbers as well that you need. And uh, yeah, I'd look. So Timo Werner has certainly got his, his faults. Um, but when he does what he's meant to, he can be quite a useful addition to the squad. I still believe that. And I know it's it's not a popular opinion, but I do believe it. Uh, but then, of course, we've got uh, Jan Min Hyuk as well. Jan Min Hyuk arrives. Uh, he's going to arrive next month to start kind of settling into life in England. I think he's got one more game after this international break uh, in the uh, in the Korean League. Then he will come over to England, start getting settled, and then January the 1st is when his contract will kick in with Spurs, and then he can start training and doing all that sort of stuff. 
I'm not sure whether he's, he must be able to kind of work at Hotspur way in terms of fitness stuff, like kind of almost using it as a gym, but I don't think legally he would be able to train with the team as he wouldn't be their player. That, that's what I think anyway. Um, but Spurs are going to be careful with him as well. I don't think anyone's looking at this as they're going to just throw this 18-year-old from the Korean League into much higher, faster physical league straight away. Um, he will definitely be involved around the first team squad, but I would imagine they're just going to get him into training in those early weeks in January and kind of yeah, get him used to things. I suppose you'll have an FA Cup game as well. Maybe that will be a good kind of one for him. Got to remember he's 18. He's going to come to a very different league, very different country, very different lifestyle, uh, and he's going to have to get used to it. We've seen it so many times with various players. Um, of course, Will Lankshire as well is another part of the attack. We mustn't forget him as he's now got his first goal for Spurs. And his first red card, unfortunately, as well. Um, he'll continue to learn the game this season. That's what this season will be for him, really. Learning what it's like to be part of a senior setup, really. Um, you know, who knows? You might even find in January that there's a great low move comes in for him and they think, actually, that might help him a little bit better. You never know. It, um, personally, this season, especially, I'd like to see him kind of in and around the squad a bit still. I mean, you've got Richardson certainly in... You know, while Richardson's out, we're going to see him in and around the, the squads and maybe getting Europa League game time, continue to get that as well. Um, but yeah, look, again, I mentioned those words Europa League. If they get through, there's all of that mess to play around with because the Premier League squad, I was looking at it, the Premier League squad's absolutely fine. Premier League squad, for those who still care, 14 non-homegrown players. Uh, and they've got the required eight homegrown ones as well. So technically, you could add three more players in the January window, regardless of whether they're foreign or not, and they would fit in the Premier League squad fine. And technically, Sergio Reguilon, you would think, will leave in January, surely, for the sake of his own just career, really. Uh, and that would allow you to have four open spots. And that's for players over 21 as well, because the Premier League, in their rules, if you're... Uh, under 21, you can actually be registered on a whole separate B list as well. Um, yeah, then we've got the Europa League. Europa League, we know is messy. Um, they've got a maximum of 17 non-locally trained players, if you include Yang Min Hyuk in there as well. And they've also got seven association trained players when you're only allowed four, or only got room for four to use. Uh, and they've only got two club trained players. So... If you remember correctly, if you remember correctly, if you remember that only having two of the four required club trained players means you can only you have to leave two spaces, so you can only leave twenty three spots in your team. So seventeen plus seven does not go into twenty three. Um, sorry, plus the other two as well, plus Austin and Whiteman. So seventeen plus seven plus two does not go into twenty three at all. So you're missing players. There we've got Jed Spence out of the squad. You've got Sergio Reguilon out of the squad at this moment in time, of course, because he's not at the club. But Yan Min Hyuk will, is not in the squad at the moment. Oh, that's an awful way of describing it. Yan Min Hyuk will have to be, if he's in the Europa League squad, if the Spurs are in it at that stage, he will have to go, come in for someone else, will have to come out. So that's without even bringing anyone else in. So, yeah, horrible mess they've got themselves in the Europa League squad. Hopefully, as the years go on, that will be sorted out with all the young players they've got who will hopefully become club-trained players eventually. So, yeah. Um, what else have I done this week? Oh, I went to Tottenham Hotspur Stadium on Saturday to watch the women's North London derby. Unfortunately, they could not repeat the heroics of last year when they won 1-0. They went down 3-1. Uh, sorry, 3-0 to Arsenal. Um, it's, it's really difficult to kind of go into these games and like be utterly... Full of despair when they lose a game like that. I know they won last year. But Tottenham Hotspur women, they're so relatively new to the Women's Super League. Arsenal are this established side that have been in it for years. They've played, they're playing Champions League football constantly. Um, Spurs, you know, they're part-time. They weren't like the equivalent of like a kind of non-leaguers not that long ago. They've only been in the Women's Super League for, what is it, four years now? Four or five years? Um, I think it's four years, perhaps. And, um, yeah, so, no, maybe five. But, yeah, they're so new in it. And it was just a game where you could kind of see the differing levels. But that's what Spurs are aiming to get to. Um, and, yeah, they were just really missing. I think Grace Clinton's no longer with them. And, and I think they did 
miss someone that was linking up. Just just in the midfield, the ball's just been pumped so far forward and and uh, yeah, Jessica Nairs and, and Beth England were just kind of trying to run tirelessly onto the balls that were going nowhere near them. Um, maybe yeah, it wasn't the greatest game in the world, but good crowd. I, I don't know what the final figure was, but I think they were expecting over 20,000. Um, but yeah, right. Have a little look at the Q&A and what we've got in here before we wrap this up. Um, we've got... Okay, Nix123 asks, can you ask to do a one-on-one -on -one interview with And Seems like everyone else is. Would love to see it. Uh, I would love it. <laughs> I'd love it. Um, but, yeah, it's a funny one now. When you say the one-to-one -one interviews, I'd imagine that's Optus Sport, Australian broadcaster, um, and Premier League, probably, and Sky occasionally get the odd one. We don't really, as kind of the British kind of written press, get that. Um, it, yeah, it doesn't really work like that with us. So, yeah, we're very unlikely to get a one-on-one. -on -one. Our avenue really is trying to get in as many questions as we can pre-match and post-match. Pre-match more so. That's when you can have more of a, a kind of a decent chat of sorts with him. Um, Priyal Sangvi8214 asks... Often, uh, for the Q&A, it often seems we lack leaders on the pitch in games and we make the same mistakes over and over again. Um, can you give us an insight into what you know about the team culture behind the scenes? How effective is the leadership group? Because we don't see it on the pitch as fans. It's a great question. Um, so the leadership group obviously is very different now, isn't it? Back in the day, it was the likes of Kane, Hoybier, Lloris, Dyer, uh, players like that. And even Skippy, I think, as a young player, kind of... Uh, like kind of a them being a mentor type and him kind of learning what that was all about. Now it's very different. It's Sonny, Madison Romero, and Vicario joined this summer as a fourth member of the of the uh, leadership group. So a different kind of leadership group um, in certain aspects. I wouldn't say the previous leadership group were all kind of real big general type characters. Maybe Hoybier, probably the most vocal type out of them you can imagine. This group, they're definitely the different kinds of captains. Sonny is more of a lead by example kind of character. Uh, Madison is someone that talks to everyone. I guess he kind of unites the groups. Um, Benton Cor, you know, he is a World Cup winner. He's the man with experience. He's, he is a winner. Um, and obviously there's also the Spanish speaking section of the club, which is going to grow smaller and smaller since the summer window. Um, and I guess he would kind of unite that group as well. I would say out of those three, the one I'd probably like to see step up more as a leader is probably Romero. Um, Madison's a little bit kind of... I don't really see him as that character as much anyway. I see him as like a, a popular character within the group, um, someone that they kind of look to when they need bits of magic. Obviously, it hasn't been great for him in recent weeks, but that's kind of what they do. He's quite experienced. Romero, I do feel like he can play on this kind of leader, winner kind of thing a little bit more. Um, I don't know whether it's a communication thing or not. I don't know. But, yeah, I'd like to see that kind of shine through a little bit more. Um, with Sonny, Sonny's just like a, he, he's a player that has been at the top of the game and, and you know, it, it, well, can still be as well. And, yeah, I think it's, he's more inspirational type lead. A little bit like Lloris was, I guess, in that respect. Just different ends of the pitch. Um, would I still like to see someone in that midfield, um, you know, like a general type? Of course. I know it's cliche and old school, but I've always feel like that kind of player in there would, would be a real driving force kind of player. I don't think Bentecourt is quite that. Um, I don't think Basuma definitely isn't that. Um, you know... You could potentially see someone like an Archie Gray becoming that one day. But it's so young. He's 18. You never know. But certainly having spoken to him on a couple of occasions, the way he speaks, he's got that kind of authority about him. Uh, and I think that will grow as well. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what it is. It's a, it's a different leadership group. And is it an effective leadership group? Obviously, at the moment, it's not looking so. But again, as I said previously... Win against Ipswich and they're third and in the quarterfinals of the Carabao Cup and in a strong position in the Europa League with three wins out of four. It's just everything looks so different. It's such a stupid result. It's so annoying. Um, 
Michael Bazzoni7709 asked, do you think Levy will keep chopping and changing until he eventually pots, uh, sorry, eventually appoints Poch again? Seems like the only manager he ever trusted and had a good relationship with. It didn't spare him from being sacked, unfortunately. Um, I hope he doesn't keep chopping and changing. I think I've always kind of been embarrassed by the way Spurs have chopped and changed and never stuck to... I mean, what's the point of being a project club if you're not going to see a project through? I mean, that's just ridiculous. You, you can't exist like that. You can't act like you're some kind of win-now club when you never won anything or haven't, sorry, haven't won anything of note for years upon years upon years upon decades. That was a weird turn of phrase. Um, but yeah, I've used the phrase before, like a kind of... Poundland version of Chelsea it just doesn't work and it's shambolic and managers need to be given time to implement some kind of system and philosophy and identity at the club um, this is why you know when I see stuff even about Postacoglu there's been some daft stuff written <laughs> in the last week or so um, including articles as well um, and you just kind of think just needs they just need to get behind something they need to be brave they need to dare to do it's just like it's not rocket science i've said it before and i'm sorry to say it again the clubs that have had the most success in england yeah there might be some other factors to it but ultimately it's the ones with the stability man city manager in place for years i know there's been a lot of money there but he's been in place for years liverpool doing well built on the strong solid stable foundations that Klopp was able to put in over years I just I hate the chopping and changing nature of football and the kind of short termism nature of it. Yeah, I know it's frustrating. I know it's frustrating when things don't go the way that you want it to go. But kind of to moan about something being another rebuild and then ask for another manager, it's gonna be another rebuild. <laughs> it just naturally is. And then we go through this whole process again of having a transfer window where all of the signings have to be kind of brought in that fit the next manager's mentality and bring in, you know, oh, these players don't fit his style of football, his formation, let's get them out. You are naturally starting a new rebuild again, and that needs time. And if you're not going to see it through, oh, it's just, it's just crazy. It's crazy. I feel like I'm definitely getting that stage as a reporter. Um, I used to tell this story at college, um, journalism uh, college, had to do this kind of post a degree course um, to become a journalist. Um, like technical stuff you don't need to know. But essentially, or not interested in knowing anyway. Um, I, they would always tell this story. Of, I can't remember what paper they worked for, but this newspaper writer, when it was times of um, typewriters, he would literally have a drawer, oh, literally, had a drawer full of these various stories and reports, and he would get them out, put them on the typewriter and fill in the missing words. And I do feel like with Spurs, I'm getting to that stage, what we, 2016 summer, so we've done the eight years of covering them, where I'm getting to the stage where I'm starting to see a lot of the same repetitive patterns come up. Football was wonderful in that you still get to see a lot of cool new things. There's a lot of things that happen, you're like, okay, that's never happened before. But I do feel like, especially covering Spurs, uh, covering a club like Spurs that make a lot of the same mistakes, I do feel like, I feel like I've said that before. I feel like I've written that before. I feel like I've had that opinion before. And it is, and it's like, you know, not learning from your past mistakes means you're just going to get caught in this circle, this circle that we see so many times. Um, so yeah, chopping chain does not work for Spurs. Why in any world... It would work, you know, you, you can only get lucky once every so often. I feel like they got lucky with Poch. Shock horror, they gave him five and a half years and it was the most successful time they had. Why can that not be seen? <laughs> Why can it not be seen that he got some time to build them up? And they actually became something. The first year under Poch especially, you know, even maybe go as far as, say, 18 months, there's some iffy moments. There really were. Um... And, you know, he admitted himself in that first year he could have got sacked. And I don't understand why that's not looked at and thought, OK, the one time that we've actually given someone stability, definitely question marks over whether they pushed enough for him as it got towards the end of his time. But certainly they showed stability and shock horror. He did well and he worked well. And, yeah, they kind of almost got there. It's been the closest they've got. 
So do that again. Believe in someone. Stick to your guns over someone and actually make it happen. Make it so, in the words of Star Trek. Um, what else we got? Uh, AF140, this kind of ties into this. If our current form continues and the away record, at what point do you believe Angie's position would be in question? Personally, I would back Angie, even through some dark times. He's a proper leader with integrity and a world-class understanding of the game. Uh, yeah, look, having said all of that, football is a results business, and if the results went on an absolute downturn, I hate the fact that it's City away next, because I just think it's just not the worst possible game with the current mood. But yeah, if there was just a run of results where things weren't changing and there was any indication that he was losing the dressing room, I'm not even going to go into that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's the time when I guess, you know, things would be looked at. But from my understanding, that's nothing like the case at this moment in time. Um, what else we got here? So. Okay. Oh, that's a good one. Christopher Ricketts, 5228, asks, if Levy were to fully back Ange in the next window and buy him ready-made players like Solanke, who in the squad would he replace? And who do you think is good enough to remain in Ange's fully functioning system? Oh, very good question there. Um, it would probably be probably in central midfield, wouldn't it? I would imagine if you were going to buy a, like a, a top, top, kind of play it would probably come in that central midfield um again potentially wingers as well i don't think benzin or basuma have really locked in the number six yet it's kind of kind of alternating a little bit still between the two of them uh you would need to bring in someone that was like okay that's the first name i know he, he, he's gonna use the name rodri but let's be honest he, he's probably an exception to rule that he's just that good um but someone like that uh, I'm not saying Spurs were going to get him. I'm saying you'd need a player like that, I think, as as a number six. That would probably be the main one. Um, I mean, pretty much everywhere in a team you can look for upgrades. If if you if you if you were kind of had countless uh, or sorry endless riches. Um, dude, hi seven seven seven. Ask quick question about Sonny. If the club extends his contract for an additional year, would Son have to agree to it, or is it purely on the club's decision? It would be the club option. Uh, it would have been something Sonny would have had to agree to in his original contract. Um, trying to think if there's any been, ever been an instance where the option is shared between club and player. I don't think they would, because that's kind of the point of the contract. Um, what else we got? Granty, 1954. When do you think Archie Gray should be in midfield? A lot of money for a bits and pieces player. Could be now. It could be in these coming weeks with Benson Corral. out. I think that could be the chance to let him show what he can do. He is such a terrific young player. He really is. Um, what else we got? It's a difficult one, this really. Mo Scopes asks, is there a difference between the Spurs fans in the stadium and in Tottenham in general versus the fans on social media who do not go to the games? It's a difficult one for me to answer, really. We know what social media is like. It's like a heightened version of everything. Um, certainly some opinions that you see on social media and the extreme nature of them are probably not shared by those in the stadium. There will be certain gripes, of course, that will be, and that things that annoy fans. I mean, I, I'm quite fortunate that Maybe because I do these things. Whenever I'm on the trains and waiting at platforms or walking to the game and stadium, people will just have a little chat. And, and I like that very much. It's, it's very enjoyable. And, and kind of hearing the things that they like or don't like about Spurs, I would say, yeah, I would say only going on my experiences of that, of eight years of, of talking to probably hundreds upon, maybe even thousands of fans on the way to games and stuff like that, it's probably a far less extreme version of what you see on social media. That's probably, that would be the best way of putting it. Um, Adam C34 asks, I've always wondered why managers are so willing to give team news before a game. Wouldn't they rather keep the opposition from knowing their potential lineup, or is there some kind of obligation they have to share? Definitely not an obligation, because we've had some managers who would never tell us anything, or sometimes would fib slightly. 
Uh, Christian Stellini was a nightmare for injury news. Um, I don't think Nuno was great either, if I remember correctly. With Poch, I think it was Jesus Perez would very sparingly give out the team news uh, that they wanted out there. Um, yeah, I don't think it's an obligation, but I just think it's it's a dumb thing to kind of... Uh, I think if there's any doubt over a player, then it remains as a doubt and they keep it a little bit vague. But if the player's just, it's, they're going to be out for a game or two. Maybe they're also getting expectations managed around that. I don't know. But, um, yeah. Oh, Luis Rayado asks, what of these two scenarios would you take? Spurs winning either the FA Cup or Carabao Cup and finishing seventh, or Spurs going out of all competitions but finishing fourth this season? We have this question so much, don't we? And we're constantly asking this of ourselves. I want it all. I want Spurs to win either the FA Cup or Carabao Cup or Europa League, and I want them to finish in the top four as well. So no, no, I'm taking a stand. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not doing an either or. Um, right. I think that's probably where we're going to have to go. We're going to have to stop there, unfortunately, because it's been a while, and I think my dinner is a bit is almost ready. I'm pretty sure I can smell it almost being ready from downstairs. So I'm going to have to head off. Um, I know we didn't really go into much about the international break and who played and what we talked about Vicario and Gray. Uh, Porro's played a couple of games for Spain, I think. Destiny Doggy, I think he came on as a sub in the second game, maybe start the first. Solanke has only had a handful of minutes, which I think is probably a good thing after he jarred his knee as well. Um, and yeah, yeah, I, it's an international break. Meh. <laughs> who cares? As long as they're not injured, that's the only thing. A lot of Romero... Um, that's the only thing that really matters to us, doesn't it? That's, uh, but yeah, so we're back, back at the weekend against uh, City at the Etihad Stadium on Saturday. Oh, I know City have lost four in a row, but my goodness, you know they're going to absolutely be up for this and smarting after those defeats. So I suppose they're going to have to be at their very best. Um, yeah, I'm kind of just hoping that I'd, I'd love to be able to almost fast forward past this. I hate games at the Etihad. They're always the most just nerve racking. I know Spurs are a bit of a bogey team for City, but it doesn't always work like that. Um, yeah, the away games are always just like under so much pressure. It's, it's horrible, absolutely horrible. But hey, they got away with a 3 3 last season with um, Emerson. Yeah, it was Emerson Royale and Ben Davies, the centre backs, wasn't it? So, you know, they, they've, they've shown that they can do it. So let, let's see if they can do it again. Um, what else? Uh, marathon training is going well. Someone asked um, the other day kind of for a little update on that. So sorry for those who don't care. But yeah, it's going all right. I've kind of tried to get back into it after being away and eating far too much while in America. Um, and honestly, the amount that people have donated, we're up to about 17,300 now or something for cancer research. It's amazing. Um, and I've now kind of developed this new habit of just as I'm about to go out on a run, I look at the Just Giving webpage and have a little look at it, see the the total and just kind of remind myself why I'm destroying my body, essentially, and my knees, especially. Um, and it's making me go a little bit faster. Did my fastest 10 mile uh, yet. I've only done three or four 10 miles and this was my fastest yet. I know, albeit very slow for normal people, normal people that run, but I was quite proud of it. And uh, yeah, as always... I'm going to pop the, uh, the Just Giving page link in just in case anyone feels that they, they would like to, to contribute to uh, what is destroying me, uh, but all going to a good cause. So, yeah, right, time to head off. Spurs back at the weekend. Can't come soon enough, even if it does terrify me, these games at the Etihad. Um, and, and hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully it starts to pick up again, Spurs, after that dreadful defeat against Ipswich, where they should have been so much better. Right. Okay. As always, stay healthy, stay safe, look after yourselves. I shall catch you later. Goodbye.